The Honda Trans Alp 750 may be the most controversial ADV bike I've ever reviewed. Depending on who you talk to, it's either a good street bike that's pretty capable off-road or a piece of crap poser princess that will explode if you even so much as think about leaving the pavement. So which is it? Well, it's maybe not the best choice if you need to ride like this, but it's a pretty fantastic choice for the rest of us mere mortals. I've owned this Honda Trans Alp 750 since they first became available in the US in October. I just hit a thousand miles on it. I've ridden it on gravel, I've ridden it on dirt, I've ridden it on muddy single track trails in the snow. I've gone motorcycle camping, ridden it in the rain and the hail, and generally put it through about as much as I could think of given the current weather conditions. I haven't gotten into any sand yet, sadly, but all the sand is so wet right now it wouldn't be sand anyway i've also done a ton of mods to the bike as you can see and you can watch videos of all of these things both the rides and the modifications in my trans out playlist on my channel when this bike was first announced i did what a lot of people did i looked at the stats i looked at the pictures and i drew some conclusions that left me very disappointed i wanted a honda version of the tenere 700 and based on all that early information it was pretty clear that that's not what this bike was going to be i made a video actually talking about how disappointed i was early on long before i ever got my hands on the bike. So I bought this bike mainly for content purposes, but once I started riding it, I realized that maybe I was wrong and maybe a lot of us were wrong and it's a lot more capable than it seems just based on paper and based on appearance alone. If you're here, you're probably familiar with the Transalp 750 already, but let's just run down some basic stats. The Transalp has a 755cc parallel twin engine making 83 horsepower in the US. It's 90 horsepower overseas. It's one of the first times I've actually seen a bike called a number and the engine was actually bigger than that it's almost always smaller 270 degree crankshaft designed to reduce vibration smooth out the engines got a six-speed transmission five user modes sport standard rain gravel and a user configurable mode it has showa suspension front and rear with 7.9 inches of travel in the front and 7.5 inches of travel in the rear the bike has 8.3 inches of ground clearance it has a 33.7 inch seat height although there is a low seat available which brings that down another inch it has a 4.5 gallon tank weighs 400 159 pounds wet, has a 21 inch front wheel, 18 inch rear wheel, comes standard with a quick shifter, has a 5 inch TFT full color display, and self canceling turn signals. And you get all of this for $9,999 MSRP US. I always like to do pros and cons when I review a bike. We're going to talk about pros first, and there are a lot. On the street, this bike is fast, fun, and responsive. Not like snap your neck back, I can barely hold on fast, but more like I can go wide open throttle without thinking about it too much and have a great time fast. It carves up twisties like nobody's business and is probably the sportiest adventure bike I've ever ridden. My Norden was fast and fun on the road, but I always kind of felt like I was brute forcing it. Like I was always riding on the edge of traction control and pushing it in a direction it wasn't really made to go. Don't get that feeling on this bike at all when I'm riding fast on the street. This bike loves the street, loves it. This bike is also very comfortable. I would not hesitate to take it on a multi-day tour down the freeway or on the back roads. It's very easy to ride. It has that just throw your leg over and go feeling that the Honda CB500X has, but with a ton more power and capability than that bike. It's not too much for a newish rider, but more than enough to entertain a more experienced one. It's way better than my Tenere on the road and equal to, if not better than my Norden was on the road. They absolutely nailed the street performance on this bike. It is a blast to ride. The riding position is comfortable. The seat is comfortable. The bike is all around very comfortable. The TFT display is clear and awesome. Lots of customization options makes the bike feel very modern. Self-canceling turn signals are not something I ever thought I needed, but it sure is a nice feature to have at this price point. The quick shifter works great and is super handy, and the price, this bike is an absolutely insane value for less than $10,000. There is no complete package with more stuff for that price in an adventure bike that I've ever seen. It's got stuff that $15,000 bikes don't have. So kudos to you, Honda. I know you were trying to make a bike that was affordable to the masses, and that's a great price point to hit. Off-road, it is surprisingly good, way better than we ever gave it any credit for in the early days before anyone had ridden one. The suspension is bouncy in the rear, but pretty capable in most conditions. Even more technical stuff is possible, but you have to pick your lines and kind of take your time. It's not the most hardcore off-road suspension, but it's still a show of setup. Definitely more street tuned, but not useless as some people have made it out to sound like. This bike loves fast gravel. I absolutely love blasting up well-manicured forest roads at 50 plus. Power sliding around corners, this thing is so fun 
fun to ride in those conditions, and those are some of my favorite conditions to ride in. It has a low center of gravity, which is very confidence inspiring. The low seat height means it is easy to get your feet down in uneven terrain. These two factors combined make it very easy to maneuver and get in and out of tight spots in a way that a lot of larger adventure bikes aren't. It doesn't have the tippiness of the Tenere and feels lighter than it is. This motor is awesome off-road. It's very playful. You can spin the tire when you need to and crawl when you need to. It's got uh, a boost of of acceleration at higher RPMs, but it's still really manageable down low. You can lug it in second gear. It's not as easy to do so as the Tenere, but it's definitely possible. And honestly, I didn't feel any herky-jerkiness in first gear, kind of clutching in and out on slow speed stuff on the technical trails and whatever. That's not something I expected on a bike that's also this good for riding on the street. It's not a stellar bike off-road, but it's enough. I would do the Washington BDR and maybe even the Oregon BDR on this bike if I put different tires on it because of the sand. I would even consider attempting the Cash Mountain Expert section on this bike with better tires. I wouldn't be able to go as fast as I did on my 450L, but I feel pretty confident that I could get to the top. You know, it wouldn't be as fast as it would be on a Tenere or something, but it's not incapable. It's just slower in those situations. But it's not perfect, and there are some very obvious misses, some very obvious cons with this bike, or just questions and design choices that I don't understand. The first of which is the windshield is really good if you're short enough to get behind it. I'm only 5'10", and I need about two inches more windscreen. So most average riders are going to find themselves in the wind a little bit, but when you can get down behind the screen, it's actually fantastic and quiet. They do make a taller windscreen, they make side wind deflectors, or you can just add a wing thing to the top of the screen, which I'm ordering or trying to order. I just just keep not getting the whole thing when I order it. No cruise control is a huge miss. Everyone complains about that. It's a curious omission, but it's not a deal breaker for me. I've only ever had one bike with cruise control. Limited ground clearance is concerning, but it's as much ground clearance as other notable off-road bikes like the KLR and the GS. I don't really see it being a huge problem, except in situations like on the Oregon BDR, you're in these rock garden-y sections and sometimes your bike's bouncing up and down and you'll pop off one rock and go down into a, a space between them. And it's very possible for the suspension to compress and for that ground clearance to become almost no ground clearance and to hit really hard on top of one of those rocks. And that's a concern when you've got eight inches of suspension travel and 8.4 inches of clearance. So you just have to take it easy, pick your way in those sections. It's not the kind of bike that you're gonna be blasting through technical stuff. You're definitely gonna have to pay attention to what you're doing, but that doesn't mean it can't go those places. It just can't go those places as quickly or as uh, carelessly as you can on other motorcycles with better suspension and cr ground clearance. Disengaging the ABS and the traction control is a huge pain in the ass. This is true of many bikes because of the rules or whatever, but why can't it just default back to one of the modes with ABS when I turn it off and back on? Why do I have to completely reset my entire user mode every single time? Why do I have to go in and turn off the ABS and the TC when you could just have it default to standard mode when the key comes off? and I could just hit the mode button and go back to it. That could be easier. Again, it's not a deal breaker, but it's freaking annoying. It has too many modes that I feel like are kind of pointless or redundant. I guess that's uh, setting it up for different riders. So they're pointless and redundant for me because I feel like the gravel mode is absolutely pointless because you can't even hardly get going on gravel. The traction control is too aggressive. The rain mode makes sense when it's super duper slippery out, but those the gravel and the rain mode feel like they overlap a lot. I've, I haven't had it in standard mode since the day I bought it. I just keep it in sport mode all the time. But I guess if I was a newer rider trying to get used to the bike, maybe that standard mode would make sense. There's no true off-road mode. Now there is a user mode. You can set the settings to whatever you want. I just turn everything off. But other more modern bikes have off-road traction control. They have a six-axis IMU that can tell when the bike's leaning and factor all those things in and give you really fine control even in technical, difficult, loose off-road conditions. The Norden has that. The 890 has that. The Tiger 900 has that. So it would be really cool to have that on this bike, but that's obviously an expensive feature. Those bikes all cost at least 50% more. And as this bike, I feel, was built for the masses, for the average Joes, most of those people don't need or wouldn't appreciate that, or they don't feel like it is something that they have to have on an adventure bike. They're just going to take on gravel once in a while and go explore in the woods. You can't shut off the front ABS at all. Absolutely hate that. It's ill-equipped for even mild off-road from the factory. You need to add hand guards and a skid plate and crash bars if you're going to do anything more than manicured gravel. Now, this is true of most bikes, even ones with stock skid plates 
plates. They're usually about the thickness of a coffee can and you want to replace that anyway. But man, there's been a lot of controversy around the routing of the exhaust and the oil pan that could have been avoided if they just slapped a stock skid plate on here. Either way, the way that it comes from the factory is not a condition I would feel comfortable taking it on anything more than manicured gravel. I did not do so until I got these crash bars on the skid plate on here and now I feel a lot more comfortable on it. The rear suspension is pretty bouncy on the rough stuff. This is not a bike you can blast through whoops on in stock form, but uh, that's not what it's for. There's only one colorway in the US. I like the black a lot. This is the color I would have chosen, but a lot of people wanted to see that classic red, white, and blue livery, and we don't have it here yet. They only got that one in Europe. This thing does not have a 12 volt factory accessory plug or a rail for mounting a GPS. Isn't it supposed to be an adventure bike? And what's worse is there's a hole for the 12 volt factory accessory plug, but you have to buy one from Honda and install it yourself or have the dealer do it for a ridiculous amount of money. That again, seems like a cheap quality of life thing. Like take my self-canceling turn signals and give me a 12 volt port. I'm gonna use that a hell of a lot more. It does have a USB-C port, but for some reason it's under the passenger seat. It's actually under this back cowling. Make it make sense. Technically, we can't use the app that connects to the display that gives you on-screen navigation and control of your music here in the US. It's not supported in the US, but you can download it from an unofficial site and make it work. I've done that. And uh, the front of this thing is ugly. It gives NC750 vibes. Now, that's not a deal breaker at all. It just, imagine how cool this thing would have looked with a cool retro single round or even better, a double round headlight setup like the old Africa Twin. That would have given this thing such a classic look. So I feel like that's a miss in the design department, but my guess is they're reusing parts from other bikes, maybe even the NC750X. That's all well and good, but what's the final word? What's the verdict? What's my feeling and opinion and conclusion about this bike after riding it for a thousand miles over several months? Well. A lot of us were wrong about this motorcycle. We made assumptions and judged this bike based on what we thought it should be or what we thought we wanted and did not pay attention to what Honda was actually trying to accomplish. Let me just quote from the design document where Honda explains the philosophy behind creating this motorcycle. The new XL750 Transalp is designed for all round, magnificent scale, long touring performance in comfort, from city to motorway, from mountain passes to unpaved roads. The aim was to enable you to enjoy a motorcycling lifestyle that is freer and more adventurous than ever before. Honda never set out to make a Tenere killer. As much as I would like to have a Honda version of the Tenere, a Tenere killer, a Honda, I don't even know, Africa Twin 700. That's not what this is. It's never what they wanted to make. So we were all wrong for assuming that and we're wrong to judge it by that criteria. This Transalp was built from the ground up for all around performance. Most ADV bike manufacturers say that about their bikes, but this bike actually does it. Honda nailed a very good sweet spot in terms of balancing on and off-road capability and price with this bike. It's a blast to ride in all but the most extreme conditions. It's got enough power to keep experienced riders engaged, but is easy enough that even a beginner could handle it in rain mode. It can handle easy to intermediate off-road with ease and even survive more advanced stuff if you're patient and understand its limitations. It has none of the disadvantages of most adventure bikes like excessive seat height, top heaviness, harsh suspension, aggressive throttle response, and all of the advantages of the best touring bikes. It's not a smaller Africa twin. Honestly, it's more like a Junior 1250 GS. Same highway touring comfort and stability with similar levels of off-road performance, including nearly identical ground clearance without the excessive mass. If you want to haul ass through the desert doubling up whoops like a Dakar rider, well, this isn't the bike for you. It wasn't designed to be. For us normal everyday riders, however, it's damn near perfect. If you're less concerned with pushing limits and telling tall tales of how you barely survived, and more interested in riding just about anywhere and enjoying it all in relaxed comfort, the Transalp is a fabulous choice. This bike is going to be a massive seller precisely because it's designed to be the perfect bike for real world riders. The weekend warrior types like me will love this bike, and there's way more of us than there are riders like this. Honda said it best. The aim was to enable you to enjoy a motorcycling lifestyle that is freer and more adventurous than ever before. Nailed it, Honda. Nailed it. Excellent! This bike is an absolutely insane value for $999,000. Nope, that's a lot of money.